Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, a platform where we discuss the mental, physical, and emotional health of your world. Welcome to Where Mind Meets Body, with your host, Kristen McAdams. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, y'all. I'm your host, Kristen McAdams move away from manipulation step into some self-awareness. We have an awesome topic for you today. Um, Before we get started, their usual disclaimer right at the top. uh, This is not to be mistaken for professional advice. If you need to see a medical professional, please do so. Uh, You can dial 988 Suicide Prevention Hotline, text 741-741, text HOME to that number to get some assistance immediately. And we also have some resources dropped uh, at the end of the episode and in the episode description. Also, if you're a client and you hear something that you don't like, you please bring it up in session. Uh, otherwise, uh, feel free to ask for referrals. I am a big advocate for therapeutic fit. And if there is something that is irreconcilable for you, um, I completely understand that. And we can work that out. That being said, let's get on to the good stuff. I'm in studio today with Ashley Carmen. She is the owner and founder and magician behind <laughs> Altered Psychedelics. Uh, this is a practitioner training company and community of support for people that are uh, practitioners, therapists that are interested in learning about psychedelics and working with psychedelics in their practice. She does a lot of amazing things. Ashley, I'll let you talk in more detail about cool. what it is you do. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, excited to be here. Tell us a little bit more about uh, Altered Practitioners. Altered Psychedelic Practitioners, APP, is a professional association, a community of active psychedelic practitioners of all kinds. Um, uh, emphasis on the diversity of our group. What we do essentially in the association, our meat and potatoes, if you will, is consultation, which can be very clinical. Um, And uh, but we're not only geared towards clinical professionals; we're geared towards all psychedelic professionals in the field. So, energy healers, shamanic, more earth-based wisdom, ancestral practitioners, and your classical, you know, Western clinicians, yeah. psychiatrists, I call it psychotherapists. Such MDs. a divide. There's so, so Yeah, I hate to describe it as polarized, but, but it is. there's a bit of a, yeah, on opposite ends of the spectrum here. Yeah, um, it is. That's one of my biggest passions right now is I, I really am trying to emphasize combining fields, which is why I love what you do, because it does that. It provides a space for people to come together and talk okay. about um, a, a, a common interest right Right. and get consultation around a common thing definitely emerging right now yeah huge huge. yeah and and i'm i'm really wanting to bridge and create collaboration i'd say excuse me collaboration is definitely the the goal yeah i think we need more of that in the world in general yes can we come together collaborate connect explore discuss like adults yeah (laughs) and not just sit on our opposite ends and yell at each other point fingers yeah judge each other and names at each other right. and yeah that's I think that's probably at the core of a lot of people's mental health challenges in general not right now mm. anyways mm-hmm. um we were watching a documentary last night actually that side note that reminded me of everything that we went through during COVID and it was like all these news clips and stuff and I was like oh my god we went through that like yeah. we really just went through yeah, that talk about polarized yeah families friends right and yeah. it's like now we're all just like kind of sliding back into t- t- normal right. and it's not it's not the same. Like it's, it's not changed. Normal. Us. It's, it's not normal. Not. It's not. <laughs> We're not back to normal. Right. Whatever that is. I don't think we'll ever be back to whatever that was pre COVID, but that's and as it is. As yeah. you, how could you go back to that? Yeah. That's and why it's called the new normal. Come on now. Yeah. You get with the programming. <laughs> but and it's interesting because it's like things like psychedelics have been like, diverted back into the abnormal or Mm. the alternative right like they use terms like alternative right to talk about yeah they're othered yeah in some ways yet there's so much history and you know civilizations for millennia thousands of years thousands of years thousands of years have been but but that's the alternative that's not the the norm what we do now is the norm um yeah, and it, why? That's yeah. where my mind goes, why? Why is that? Hmm, is there something else there? Is there an agenda? Is something else happening? Why yep. 
Why does that exist? That's and, why I knew when I met you, I was like, we're going to connect because I'm that yeah. person too. I'm always like, yeah, but why? Right. <laughs> like, why? I want to be an eight year old. Tell me why. Yeah. It's this a really great question. I actually, I'm working with a client right now and he, he loves to bring his son up in session and, um, his son is the teacher because his son's always like, why? And then his dad, he'll go, but well, well, why did you ask why? And he's like, why? Yeah. It's just always why, <laughs> just why. And then you're like challenged immediately yeah. in that moment to be very like, good therapeutic oh. skill too, right? Mm-hmm. Like unpack. Mm-hmm. It made me think of when I was getting ready for the show today. Like I, I tend to keep things pretty casual. I usually have on like some black t-shirt and a hat. Love the hat. Like, yeah, fr- <laughs> some friends of mine got this for me because I just got, I was over it. Like yeah. people were just like you just, you just skip that whole thing in the beginning. Yeah, I'm just read my hat. Yeah, the answer right, is keep yes. talking. I already know what you're gonna ask. Yeah. Here's your answer. I can't not diagnose you. It's how I think as a human. It's literally the basis of the foundation right. of how I think about the world. So yeah, I'm probably diagnosing you. Oddly enough. For free. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. I, I <laughs> oddly like, and it's so funny because people think of mental health as like being diagnostic, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and I don't diagnose in my practice. So mm. I think this hat's even funnier. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. Thank I you don't. for, I don't either. And yeah. clients actually really sometimes, when, when I had my talk therapy practice, I've actually closed that down. April of this Good year. Good for you. Yeah, which is big because it <laughs> yeah, took so much huge. to build that and create that and go into yeah. that and get comfortable with that and then to make that successful and to find my groove with that. And then right when I found my groove, I'm like, okay, I think I'm complete. <laughs> I think I'll close it down now and shift totally into did psychedelics. It. <laughs> um, but in, in that talk therapy practice, a lot of clients wanted a diagnosis. Like they would yes. ask me for a diagnosis. I'm yes. like, hey, I'm not coming to you with a diagnosis. Yes. Why are you coming to me yeah. wanting or needing a diagnosis? You're like, you need a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. She could talk to somebody about that. Yeah. 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 No, I find that a lot. And I think that has a lot to do with the social construct around mental health, right? There's so much time we spent trying to lift the stigma and now lifting the stigma means making room for diagnoses right Mm -hmm. and there's this messaging out there that like as a human you're broken you're flawed something's wrong with you you need to like take some sort of you know antidepressant or you need to take a xanax to calm down like we're always trying to like put ourselves in some sort of like box that to be it's not human good enough i mean there's there's just like the medical model that that that's what it's built on like you're not going to get your therapy paid for you're not going to get your prescriptions at all if you don't have this billing code which is like emphasis on billing code that's where i think most of this came from is it's a billing code and justification for medical necessity it's an insurance ploy yeah um, Which is guised in like um, like standard of care. It's guised in like, oh, well, we have these standards to keep you safe. But I think it's just making people sicker. Yeah, well, the, the, there is a box that happens. It's a bit of a trap. And I'm, you know, I make space for all of it because the client's experience is what matters. It doesn't matter my opinion or what I think. And I leave space for that. And so totally. it can be very validating to be like, oh, I, other people have what I have and suffer from borderline personality disorder mm-hmm. Or panic attacks, and it's not just me, and it's, you know, I'm not the odd person or the weirdo here, like the rest of other people in society have this too. So there is a bit yeah. of like validation that is therapeutic in a sense, but yeah, then then we're labeling ourselves. Now we're con- we're identifying as yeah. this diagno- diagnosis, and um, where does that, is there a ceiling? Like where does that end? Does that mean for lifelong? Yeah. How do we experience that? Um, and, uh, yeah, I very much try and shift clients out of it. And I, I let them know also, I don't work from a diagnostic perspective. It's, this is your human experience. And personally, right. I believe we're all on, uh, uh, we're all on this, the spectrum of these diagnoses to some certain, to a certain degree. We all experience these things, a little bit of maybe narcissism or depression yes. or anxiety or, yes. you know, relationships uh, can become exaggerated or valued and deep because like we're humans with brains and yes, we're it's complicated complex <laughs> you want to put us on paper and make it black and white it just doesn't work that way but. yeah nope it only works that way for for a regulated system for insurance purposes. insurance yep <laughs> that, ah, <they're laughs> <lucky. Sir>. <laughs> <laughs> fucking insurance and bane of my existence I, I i it's interesting though when you talk about that um that that sense of community like that like oh i see this in other people and other people struggle with this and it's not just me like I feel like that's sometimes that's the buy in to expanding your perspective. It's the buy in to like, it doesn't really matter like how you enter 
this that type of processing mm-hmm. like sometimes the way th- to enter is like oh mental health is a thing it's important for me to take care of my mental health yeah i saw her on tiktok that <laughs> i match these <laughs> diagnoses right. i have add yep i have add i have <laughs> autism. autism i have yeah tourette's Thank i you. have tiktok yeah <laughs> i can appreciate the normalization of it I, I i appreciate that you know try and bring some silver lining or gratitude to it that it's more common talk and commonplace and yeah. I think there's with social media, those generations, um, it's spread and it's just become normal and it, it's okay to talk about your feelings. Yeah. Um, but like with anything where it was the ha- harmony and balance in it. And, yeah. um, it's like, a, it's trying to find a way back to like connection in yeah. a way, right? Like right. the internet and everything and COVID and, you know, deterioration of families and neighborhoods and things like that has like drawn us into this isolation. And then you hear that repeated. That's part of the thing that we listened to last night too, is like you Mm. hear on repeat, like you're alone, you're lonely, you're alone, you're lonely, you're isolated, you're alone, you're lonely. And then people are like, I don't know how to find community. So then they go online, they go on TikTok and they say, I must be trans or queer or have borderline or... I must belong to this category. Yeah, can I belong? And these are my people. Let me connect with them. I'll be accepted here because we're the same in that way. Yeah. Yep. (sighs) (laughs) There are other ways. Yeah, (laughs) there are other ways. My thoughts exactly. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> me and Ashley just sigh. Like, <laughs> don't even know where to go. Yeah, there's there's so much, it, it, but it's it's a normal part of human behavior. Also, as it thing. is, yeah, like it's you know, what do I need to do to stay a part of the tribe so that I can eat yep. and have protection yep. and have people helping me raise my children? Like, what do I do to stay tribal to yep. make sure that I'm uh, being accepted and not being rejected? Because rejection is death could mean death and it's, it's got to be so hard for people to wrestle with that these days like just the whole emphasis on authenticity and individuality and hyper independence as a coping strategy and all of mm-hmm. these things right and like we're calling all the men narcissists we're calling all mm-hmm. the women bpd and now everybody's you know has a free license to behave poorly and like identifying with their behaviors and you're like you're not your behaviors right, right? like if you were to really face your fears and tolerate that discomfort and like take a breath and go, you know, yeah. embodiment, I think, which I was going to end with today, but we can start with it too. Like, sure. I feel like that 80% of that embodiment coupled with like mental flexibility to a degree, right? You don't want to be so flexible that you have no structure mentally, mm-hmm. right? But you don't want to be so rigid that you mm-hmm. can't expand or evolve your mind or perspective. So I think those two components are really what people need in the diagnosis and the yeah. labeling doesn't allow for that it doesn't allow for embodiment it's rigid it's fixed yeah it's it's a criteria on uh, under a diagnosis and it's not um it's there's no ebb and flow to it it's just this is what you are it's black and white it's fixed um yeah i I was thinking about the masculine and the feminine and the rigidity of the masculine which is so necessary for structure yeah but also having um the the masculinity and the rigidity enough in in harmony enough to allow for the fluidity and the flow yes. of the feminine and essence and yes we all harbor that those masculine feminine traits yeah. yeah need both of them absolutely yeah absolutely and need them in different contexts and different reasons and i don't know there's certain freedom in that too to, to be able to embody both but why don't we jump over to the threshold section? I want to talk about your experiences with starting APP cool. and uh, getting into the world of psychedelics. Yeah, let's um, do it. Yeah, let's jump into the threshold. Good job. Yeah. Way crack, to go. Crack that code. <laughs> <laughs> solving problems between segments That's right our producer is a champion over here crushing yeah feel free to jump in if you have any questions too about psychedelics because i know that you don't have a lot of interest or, or experience well, i'm sure i'll get there at some point here yeah. yeah he's been curious he just wants to know you know psychedelic curious yeah that we, we're big proponents of that's that a, that's a group too isn't it right it yeah be. where's your tag you have a sticker <laughs> for that maybe you got some swag <laughs> Hashtag curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
I, I think I, you know, a lot of times doing this podcast, I'm always like nervous about if I say anything, right? And I think that's uh, a common fear with therapists and practitioners, yes. right? So, yeah, don't self-disclose. You're not human. Yeah. Black and white, tabla rasa. Yeah, don't be a human. Don't be, you know, don't don't be a sexual <laughs> being. Don't be a curious being. Don't have being. any preferences. Don't have any opinions. Yeah. Don't like colors. Yeah. Don't wear your ring. You have to <laughs> you, remain a blank slate. You put up an awesome post about that the other mm. day talking about graduating. And you're like, I'm a therapist, right? Like, yeah. what about the people that I did help? Like, you're going to come at me with this judgment about who I need to be as a therapist and yeah. I just had so much respect and appreciation for thank that thank you I was I was lit I was there was a lot of fire and passion yeah behind that and it's it I saw this one small thing which obviously had nothing to do with me but it was the can opener to a whole can of worms of something that had been accumulated yeah. accumulating for a while and it was just like you know what I'm just gonna say something I don't I don't often take to social media to like air or vent um but i do i love that shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i i every once in a while i'll just be like you know what i just want everybody all, all, my whole the whole world my whole 2000 follower world yeah. <laughs> i want everybody all 800 to know of how you. i feel about this okay <laughs> yeah listen here think about that chew on this these are my thoughts right. i need you to hear them i matter <laughs> Uh, no, I love that though because I think that that is a shared perspective among mental health practitioners. I, I, not everybody, but to like I certainly had that. And being here and doing this podcast, like for the first three years, I was like, I can't say that. I have to be careful. And yeah, there's so much well, fear. You know, you're being a good therapist, good little therapist. Yeah, you know, well governing board is going to come in and spank you if Which you is cross the line. Not in my personality profile. That's not in my personality right, to profile. Comply. To comply Rebel. is not. Nice. It's not. This is why we're here. Yes, <laughs> That's totally why we're here. That being said, like growing up and this is why i was like i'm going to self-disclose right like growing up i did a lot of mushrooms growing up i smoked yeah. a lot of weed i did a lot of mushrooms i don't do any of that as much these days but back then i did a lot uh -huh. and i think that the psychedelics actually it was different back then i feel like um I, it's so much more um like branded now or mm -hmm. like i don't know like the 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 weed these days or marijuana these days way different than it was when i like we had to like go to somebody's weird basement in boston and you know pick yeah, seeds and stems out of sack. stuff yeah yeah that's like a whole thing crack open the swisher sweet to roll the blunt yeah yeah like it was a whole process it was a whole lifestyle right yeah, you got choices and options now it's so different now it's wildly different now but i really do think that that introduction to psychedelics like i was so passionate about lifting the stigma of mental health like we talked about earlier and like i was so passionate about like using these natural things mm -hmm. as tools for experiencing a different way of having that mental flexibility, changing your mind, like just having yeah. a different experience, you know, and I did have different experiences and it was, it did feel so, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit in the research too, but it did feel like so mind opening at, at, at its core, just yeah. at, basically at Consciousness its core. Consciousness expansion. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah. I, I appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, I, I feel pretty comfortable being, uh, open book even as a therapist i think it took me a while i've been practicing for seven eight years now it took me a while to get to that point it wasn't yeah. always like that but uh it's turns like out weights. <laughs> if you want to develop a relationship with somebody you have to give yeah something yeah. you have to reciprocate and such a good point and so i think that uh and and uh, yeah, from where I'm sitting, I I very much consider the relationship the vehicle of change mm -hmm. uh, with clients. So, anyways, I I go into that tangent because I'm I feel more comfortable these days being like, Real. oh yeah, I'm human too. Surprise, surprise! I'm not just a therapist. I'm human. Yep. And the self disclosure actually helps the client. So I've I've embraced more of a self more of a self disclosure when when it's a, there's when also it's appropriate. yeah, yeah there's also guidelines ways. around that and ways yeah. to do that yeah um but appropriately self-disclosing so yes uh i did drugs <laughs> in high school <laughs> and um, i've done the drugs yes, i know what they do <laughs> experience the drugs and put some things in my system um and you know i don't psychedelics weren't actually that common i'm from the san francisco bay area uh for my generation it was a lot of weed mm -hmm. which i did very much abuse i'm actually kind of coming full circle with cannabis yeah now um because it's i've been invited to like cannabis ceremonies and i was such a stoner in high school me and my best friend our senior shirts were mym me you and mary and she was four and i was 20 and uh, we would like smoke bongs hit bongs on the way to school like on the <laughs> way to high school and anyway i was a stoner like i went deep with it and so i feel like i've abused the yeah. plant and i was a very abusive in that relationship and so did that for you know high school through 
early 20s and then mid 20s was like oh i'm actually kind of uncomfortable when i smoke weed very self-conscious and yeah this is not fun anymore and so yeah, yeah. stopped and um coming full circle now where it's like okay i you know intention matters and yes i'm going to be intentional with my consumption of anything not just substances or plants but food, food or, or beverages yeah, or, yeah. tv social media like yeah. intentional about consumption because my body is my temple and i care yeah. about what i'm consuming yeah. on uh, from all my sensory uh, experiences so yeah, I'll we'll, uh, hopefully come full circle with that. That's what's plan. so interesting, too, about, like, people that did have, like, it's so funny that you had an acronym, like, my friends all did, too. Uh-huh. We were like, oh, baby, like, the store, be, like, be eventually baked every day. Like, that was our <laughs> motto. But, like, you look back now, and, like, we were so troubled. Like, and that is part of what I self disclose is that I, you know, I, I struggle with depression. I stu- struggle with anxiety and PTSD and all of these things throughout my life, but I've healed them all by Mm -hmm. doing exactly what you just said, right? Being intentional with Mm -hmm. how I treat my body and how I treat my mind and what I choose to consume and how I Mm. think about things. And I think that, you know, when you're a kid and like, especially in Boston, like in Boston, the, the, the drug scene in Boston is outrageous. Like the majority of the kids we went to high school with overdosed and died on heroin. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was hardcore. Very intense. So we were like the good kids in comparison to that. It's it's pretty much like all of New England, too. It is all of New England. Especially when you get into like the northern states, like uh, New Hampshire. Oh, yeah, it's real bad. Like New Hampshire, even uh, parts of Vermont. Like it's. For a lot of reasons. A lot of. We could do a whole other episode on that. But for a lot of reasons, it's very rampant up there. Um, And it's, it's. I don't know. It was at the core of why I started down the path that I did. Uh, my best friend overdosed and died on, on heroin mm. addiction. And I wasn't, I was going to leave the field of psychology. And then that happened. And I was like, well, now I have to dedicate my entire life to this. Right. And got a degree in yeah. substance addiction and all that substance abuse studies. Um, yep. But I spent a couple of years in uh, yeah. working at a residential rehab. Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole Substance experience in and of itself. Yeah. It's a whole revolving door of things yeah. too. Like Thank you for the work that you do. Yeah. There. I, I mean, make, same cheers. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's tough work, but I really, uh, appreciated all, all working with that population and, mm-hmm. and being required, you know, I guess kind of coming back to the post a little bit, Yeah, being required to have that experience because yeah. you know, needing 3000 hours. I, I was an intern for, I spent three years at, at a residential rehab, government-funded program, 15 women living in one house, yep. detoxing. Yep. Government-funded program means that uh, I, no I was resources. working with homeless people, no resources, homelessness right in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've got uh, some people from the Tenderloin Districts and some prostitutes from East Oakland, and I've got some yeah. gang members from Redwood City, and we're all, ha- you know, kumbaya yeah. <laughs> detoxing off heroin we're on our methadone. We're all doing music therapy. And- <laughs> right. <laughs> Figuring out life together in one house. <laughs> it was exactly what I needed. Yeah. It was exactly what I needed to yeah. learn some skills. Yeah. To yep. sit with people that have been through some heavy shit. Yep. Yeah. And to absolutely. moderate myself and to regulate myself and to notice myself and to become aware of my thoughts and to become aware of my feelings and to become aware of my biases. Totally. And how do I employ interventions and how do I employ skills and what's right for the person and what matters and, and what the all fuck of the am things. I doing? Yeah. How the fuck do you work with humans? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's a little bit different and it requires a skill set. So yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's um I'm very grateful for for that time. And it taught me a lot about trauma and a hundred percent is a part of my tapestry and journey that brings me here to the space of psychedelics and really respect the people that put in the work to, uh, you know, meet as outlandish or ridiculous or arbitrary as they may seem the, to meet the criteria mm-hmm. uh, and re- get the qualifications to yeah. do the work. I mean, I, I take the psyche very personally. I take it very seriously. I, yeah. Try not to take it too seriously, you know, because we can always work with things, but it's um, it's spiritual, it's personal. Like it's, you know, I, I don't take it lightly. Yeah. It, it, I handle it delicately, no matter who's sitting across from me. And so there's a great deal of respect that I bring to that. And I, I, I question people that may poke and prod around in there because they yeah. have granted themselves the yeah. ability to do so. Yeah, I hear a lot of really terrible things too from practitioners or like um friends of friends or people that have shared, you know, uh, those types of internship type experiences where, uh, there's a the belief that, that you need to keep people sick so they keep coming back and like, you mm. don't need to be as effective, right? All you need to do is like validate and hold the, the job space. Security? 
Right. And it's like, but it's like that, right? Like they, they weren't doing what you were doing and sitting there in that space and saying, how do I work with these people? How do I make a change? How do I, how do I come up with a solution? Like how do I embody this practice and come up with a way to actually help people? Mm-hmm. Right. Cause you look at the government funded programs or you look mm-hmm. at like the rehab and the treatment centers and the revolving doors around those yeah. things. And it's like, you know, it's great for practitioner development and stuff like that. But right. at the end of the day, it's like, what what would you say we're doing here yeah Yeah. (laughs) what are the tools and resources and skills and i think that that's why you know psychedelics is such a amazing cutting edge thing that we're doing now which again been around for thousands of years even the actor like the the research the, the act of studying it has been around for decades and we're only now just starting to, I mean, really scratch the surface, even though we have Western. a lot of knowledge mm-hmm. about it. So yeah. what brought you into it? I, God, <laughs> God brought me into it. <laughs> short answer. It's um, a great answer. But, you know, I, okay, so just like my personal, I, I got into it personally and professionally at the same time. Mm-hmm. And my first introduction to psychedelics was actually in the sixth grade. <laughs> Nice. With my cousin, who uh, turns out didn't have such great ideas, but was a lot <laughs> older than me, and uh, decided thought that we should eat mushrooms on a pizza, and so we ate mushrooms on a pizza. I'm in sixth grade; he's he's in his early twenties, and watched The Cell with Jennifer Lopez. Oh, I don't know if you remember. Oh no, yeah, I do remember that movie. That is not a movie you watch on mushrooms. <laughs> not in sixth grade. No, very poor idea. Um, but that was my first introduction to psychedelics, and I felt complete with that. I never needed to return to that experience. <laughs> I don't need to do that again. And so, didn't touch another psychedelic until um, until my late twenties. Um, and part of actually what influenced not returning to psychedelics is was my experience as the at the residential rehab where I worked with a lot of clients that had substance induced psychosis, mm-hmm. and they were working yeah. with abusing. Yeah. Not intentionally abusing psychedelics and right. also had a myriad of other variables, right. which um, need to be in place to induce a psychosis, yeah. you know, a pre a genetic predisposition or not. Like yeah. your uh, how well you're sleeping matters, how well you're hydrating matters, the yes. quality of your relationships in your environment matters. And so they had, you know, the perfect formula to induce a psychosis and were abusing yeah. certain psychedelics. So I kind of saw that also. I'm like, yeah, I'm still good don't really need to touch any psychedelics. I like the way that I'm filtering reality now. So yeah, yeah. I'll steer yeah. clear. Um, and then had a, a friend in my late twenties that was just couldn't take her hands off a mushroom. She was just gobbling mushrooms and was having little bouts of psychotic breaks here and there. And yep. I'm just, still I'm, I'm good. I don't think I need to go yep. there. Um, but it had a bit of, had a transformation. Uh, when I turned 30, I left my, ex-partner of six years that I was engaged to. I lost 60 pounds. I had a whole thing with like Catholicism versus spirituality and was introduced mm-hmm. to mindfulness mindfulness and Buddhism and um, then was feeling more called to psychedelic. There was a curiosity. I didn't, I didn't even know then like what a calling was or was and I was just, I describe it now as a calling but then was just like, oh, it's just curiosity. I'm curious yeah. what's here and so dropped acid at the Chinese New Year Parade in San Francisco <laughs> as my introduction. So that's a good idea. Two major intros. <laughs> Dragons and fireworks and police and... Um, no, no pressure there. <laughs> you know, I needed to retreat to the house and then spent the rest of, of the experience looking out. Um, oh gosh, twin, the Quait, I think it was the Quait Tower Hill where it just looked like a UFO. I'm like, this is really, really rad. And, <laughs> and was enjoying my experience. And um, what came of that was my trust for myself. I was like, okay. Mm, that's such a good point. I still have my core self. Um, I realized and tapped into like the strength of myself to yeah. navigate an experience like that and what felt like I still had me yeah. and didn't just completely lose, lose myself and was totally out of control and controls a whole other thing. But yes, um, big component safety is yeah. what I got again from that experience. Like, okay, it's safe to explore these things and to venture off in my consciousness in these ways and to, yeah. to explore the, the psyche and I still have myself and feel, feel safe doing so. So that was, not the best way to introduce that, <laughs> but it's how it happened. And uh, I felt a lot of safety there. So then I, I began exploring with um, with psilocybin and um, and knew that I wanted to take it up uh, professionally also. So I was personally exploring and professionally seeking more education around it. That's amazing. And it's like it, it encompasses every angle of 
being an experienced practitioner, right? You're like, not only do I have this experience of working with people that have had induced psychosis because of these variables, Mm -hmm. right? Or friends that are just doing it on their own, but my own experience, bad ones and good ones, right? Like I've had this whole breadth of knowledge that I can bring to the table. Talk about being a real lived person with a shared experience and being able to connect to the client. Like you hit, you hit every container that there is to approach that, topic and way of thinking about things which i, I think that's for awesome recognizing that yeah no it's amazing it, it's um in app that's one of the one of our code of ethics is having lived experience with the medicine that you're serving yeah. is to know the territory one of the questions i got all the time at the residential rehab which is interesting it keeps on coming up here it feels so relevant for whatever reason but um because we're talking about substances and drugs yeah and medicine <laughs> and medicines also but, and we relate in that way if yes, you've been through that you yeah, know it real shared. well <laughs> um uh, it's, uh, they wanted to know if I had su- suffered from an addiction, you know, can you speak my language? And so I, I just yes. think of it similarly. It's like, have you been here? Yeah. Can you speak to this experience yeah. personally, not just textbook? Cause that's, yeah. that's education and knowledge, which is important, has a place, but really wisdom comes from lived experience. Yep. People and don't so, get it unless they've had that experience. I think that's yeah. one truth that I find to be consistent all the time is that, you won't really get it. You can, you can think about it. You can conceptualize it. You can dig really deep into like textbooks and literature and research and stuff like that. But unless you've gone through some, it's like anything though. It's like going through a divorce. It's like having a baby. It's like not being able to have a baby. It's like Mm. going through a breakup or, you know, having um, emotionally mature parents or like, you know, just like whatever. Have you actually touched on that pain? Have you actually touched on the emotional landscape here? Yeah. Um, Which is such a core component for professional development, right? Like when it goes back to saying that professionals, they say you want to be a blank slate but I think that I find that most people find their path professionally when they're using their lived experience as part of the work that they're doing because if you feel something and you know it's possible and Mm -hmm. you've gone through a process with that then you're going to be way more equipped to Mm -hmm. cope help others cope with the same journey yeah yeah my father uh has suffered from a meth amphetamine addiction my whole life Wow. Not a coincidence that I ended up working at a residential rehab. <laughs> I wasn't consciously seeking that or, or wanting to work there when I yeah. got into psychology or any of my practicums, but... You, you never know, know in the, the beginning. The would have it, yeah. Yeah, when people go out in their psychology path, they're like, I guess I want to do this. So, you know, I like to help yeah. people and people say I'm good at helping people and, you know, that sounds nice. So I'm just going to do this and then you never really know. Like, that's a big component of becoming a therapist is figuring out, like, the path to professional. Like, what got you here in the first place and how has that evolved right. over time? Which is why I really respect and appreciate you sharing your story because mm-hmm. it does capture that exact thing mm-hmm. that so many practitioners i think don't get to have conversations with other practitioners about right yeah you know? their background and their history yeah i was told i remember being in my doctor program and they were like well heart surgeons don't have to go through heart surgery to to perform uh heart surgery and i've like that always stuck with me and i was always like oh okay all right yeah but, that, that's the, the standard that, that's what we're yeah using. Okay, the, like huge a, push to get mental slusher. health on par with the medical and i'm like yeah. i don't think i want to be on par with health care no. i don't think it's going yeah, very well we, it's, it's not i don't think it's working i mean i think we have a sick care system not a health care yes. system yes. and you know talk about job security or keeping people sick um yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a revolving door, and um, what you one of the pushes also into psychedelic medicine was I was working at a Kaiser Permanente on the oh, okay. West Coast. That's where Ken Jeong worked, right? The comedian. Oh, I don't know. I <laughs> he was a doctor. I'm pretty sure he was a doctor and worked there. Fun, fun, random fact. You're just a factory worker on a factory line of mental health patients, mm-hmm. and they call it the golden handcuffs because they pay you handsomely. And Mm -hmm. uh, you feel handcuffed by the salary to keep on Mm -hmm. sacrificing your quality of life. Yep. Um, Yep. And uh, I also, as a behavioral interventionist, right, because I'm the mental health therapist, I'm doing talk therapy, Right. was pushed to um, provide a pharmaceutical or to to explore a pharmaceutical. I didn't provide the pharmaceutical intervention, obviously, on my scope, but... I was pushed during my intake to like, you know, send to the psychiatrist and push, push the pharmaceutical intervention in some ways. And two other scopes that are highly siloed, Uh, which I think is interesting, right? Like the prescribing providers, the prescribing providers versus, you know, non-prescribing and like how that has been such a rigid pathway. And it's like mental health therapists, they like, they like touch upon it now. They're like, oh, take this class in substances. And then you learn about like 
five medications you know? yeah. <laughs> and the rest it's of the world's like have you heard of and I'm like, you're like i don't know you the contraindications of that i don't right. know right i don't know how an, it, it's like it's like talking about hormones right like they talk about hormone yeah. replacement therapy these days for example and like i was sitting with a room of colleagues the other day and I, they were like all upset about hrt and i was like do you know anything about hormones mm. were you educated in hormones were you educated in anatomy mm-hmm. biology physiology mm-hmm. No, because yeah, those things matter. <laughs> they matter. And they impact how you feel. Yeah, because there's something going on at the neurotransmitters. Yeah. and the receptors. Yeah, which is impacted by everything else in your life too. It's like it's impacted by what, like you were saying, what you eat, right? Like yeah. the medications that you are on, and like if every if all these fields stay siloed like that, right? And then they're <laughs> then they're yeah, enticing that, that's you holistic. With- yeah. Let's let's also just throw holistic on our marketing website. Yeah, let's just put the word out our there. Our business cards because it's trending. So yeah. we're holistic. Yeah. We don't talk to any of your other providers or know what's going on physically for you, but it's we're the holistic. Best, best hashtag. Yeah. But yeah, so let's uh let's jump over to the approach section because I want to talk a little bit about like the science of psychedelics and cool. like how it's different yeah, than just my science. Cool. So, yeah. <laughs> we got some research to throw in the episode okay, description good. we can play with. So. <laughs> Nothing too crazy. I mean, I've reviewed it, I don't know how many times, but... It's not really it's not the basis of the work. Suit. Yeah, the, like the science. Yeah. Trust it. <laughs> All right, welcome to the approach segment. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the science. There's a lot of ways to talk about the science. Um, I think one of the big, like overarching themes and talking about the science is just you know is it good for you versus is it bad for you mm. right and um i i like a lot of dr daniel amon's work but he's a little skeptical on stuff like this like he's like a brain health guy like mm-hmm. he's very into just like your brain and its health and what you can do to keep it healthy um so he referred to psychedelics as sort of like because they call this the psychedelic renaissance now mm-hmm. like it's on the maps website right yeah and i i I don't i don't mean to interrupt you but yeah it's so interesting the renaissance i had it described this was described to me which i've since taken on but it's really it's an ecosystem that's emerging and to consider psychedelics to call it a renaissance um which sounds like such a short period in time or to to turn it into an industry yeah boxes to put psychedelics in a box feels really counterintuitive to what's actually wanting to emerge here it's an it's an ecosystem that has been around for a very yeah. long time and you know in our society and uh, you know what marketing and in, in the fields and how we just approach capitalism if you will just it's it's wanting to kind of put the, what's happening right now in a box by calling it a renaissance or calling it wanting uh, to package it yeah it's just so much bigger than that so th- that comes up for me as i hear that but please Christine. yeah no well and that's what's interesting because i think the most con- like you think about putting things in a box i think the best like, this t-shirt right like you mm-hmm. look at this t-shirt and you're like oh i know what that is it's jack daniels right mm-hmm. we have this conditioning about about preconceived packaged ideas, right? Mm-hmm. Like Jack Daniels is, you know, you can picture Jack Daniels himself. You can picture the cowboy hat. You can picture like the logo and like it's related to Johnny Cash in Texas and like all these things, right? It mm-hmm. comes with this set of like words. And when we put stuff in boxes that way, right, it doesn't get to be a curious exploration, evolution of things. It doesn't get to be like the essence of what psychedelics I think is, right. is expansive, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's not restricting. Yeah, so when you think of like, I think the most common word associated with psychedelics outside of just the word psychedelics itself now is is the idea of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary mm-hmm. Association of Psychedelic mm-hmm. Society. I don't know. Psychedelic Studies. I studies, think. yeah, acronyms. Um, but it's like, More. you look at stuff like that and every time like the government or um, academia, right, with research, because research can only look at so much, it can mm-hmm. only look at certain variables. So you wind up par- scaling down and, and shaving off different elements of things in service of trying to yeah so it's bite size yeah possibly yeah prove or disprove something which is interesting about some of the research and i I threw a variety of research studies in there Mm. um some of them are just about like the research grants like they say that you know there's all these grants out there but like there's really no government grants for psychedelics i'm told which is weird that research article is in there um it's just a it's a meta-analysis of like all the grants that do exist, which yeah. apparently is not many. I guess it's all privately funded. Right. To, to study. Is that what to you're saying? Study. Grants yeah. To study, which is also blows my mind, right? Because what are we, are we trying to figure out? What are we trying to figure out? Yeah. Trying to figure out if it works? Yeah. Because I, I think it works. 
yeah you save your money <laughs> there's well, other things you can go towards but yeah we need empirically validated yeah uh you know for our our culture and and you know again i go back and forth i'm a gemini i please i can play devil's advocate get stuck in my head in these rabbit holes of like for and against and come up with all these different arguments that's but, great though <laughs> yeah even the, the but, but yeah do, we know that it works so that's great um so what yeah why are we spending all of this money because we like, don't like things that work because we know this <laughs> we want to spend money to patent we want to spend money to figure out how oh i think of like the um they're coming out with they're trying to figure out how to isolate the psychedelic molecules i don't know exactly which ones but they're trying to take out the psychedelic part of okay psychedelics right this is kind of like science and this is empirically validated and this is research and this is laboratory stuff and it's like we're trying to isolate so much our science and our black and white and our research we're we're stripping it of the actual thing to strip nature down to sell it yeah stripping it down to sell it and you know uh, to go on a tangent um you know to the the war on consciousness rages on right Mm -hmm. it's really those mystical experiences per the studies uh that provide some of this healing effect also and and the mystical experiences are that psychedelic thing that we're wanting to try and strip so yeah i mean there's a lot of different different reasons I, i don't know what the reason is actually but there's a lot of different i'm sure hypotheticals we can come up with around why they're wanting to do that but well, just and just at like a glance of the research that is out there, because I was trying to find something that actually said that it didn't work. Because I was like, what is like, what's the counter argument, right? We talk about bad trips, right? Like we talk about like those moments of breaking into psychosis or like the, the things that have to come into place for somebody to have an induced psychosis from a substance, right? But when you look at the research, the broad majority, almost like 98 to 99% of the research, if you look at it, says that it that it works right yeah. that it works for addiction that mm-hmm. it works for cancer treatment that it works like if you yeah, look at gabor mate's work mm-hmm. right like end of life inquiry, yep. Yep. yep yeah yeah it's um it's effective it works um and i i think the research is valuable for contraindications but even then i can get in a slippery slope because first of all we're we're inviting in a bit of a psychosis like we're you know you want some mental flexibility you've got a depression you've got anxiety you've got this rigidity because you're taking on these labels or because you're stuck in an anxious state or depressed state or whatever state you're stuck in that wiring you, that yes, patterned you wiring want to rewire and so you're welcome in welcoming in a bit of a break right from the tr- from the pattern yeah from the traditional and so it might look a little psychotic, like, you know, psychedelic. You're going to have hallucinations. Yeah, you're exiting that's, the matrix. <laughs> that's on the piece of paper that says there's a psychosis happening. Um, you're and so breaking conditioning. I just want to soften that a little bit where, yeah, we're kind of actually inviting a little bit of a psychotic break in, right? Because yeah. we're, we're trying to shake things up and shake the snow globe, if you will. Yeah. Um, so I just want to normalize that a little, a little bit. Now, do we want to stay in that psychosis? That's a whole other story. Yeah. And how do you stay in that psychosis if it's for you yeah a little bit to what i was speaking to earlier there's a whole slew of things that would be in place in order in order to stay in that state um and uh you know genetic predispositions uh knowing the contraindications but also some cultures admire that some cultures think that that that's these are these are gifted individuals that present in the western as as having psychotic breaks yep it depends on the the lens that you have right like it depends on the lens yep and and then who's to say like what lens is right or wrong because i think that's what people divert to right they're like well what's right right and what's wrong and it's like well it's just your lens like yes it's that spheric 3d model like mike talked about that in his episode right he's like it's not a spectrum it's a sphere my mind was blown i was like well fuck (laughs) (laughs) i have to go back to the drawing board. yeah (laughs) yeah but i think two like really important points Right, is that the, most people when they start talking about psychedelics is um, one is like okay if you have the experience right this is part of what I, I talk about with my clients and you can correct me if I'm wrong please feel free to um, is that if you want to be able to take the experience with you right like if you have this wonderful experience on psychedelics right like the idea is that you want to be able to embody those things for the re- in, in your life not a psychosis right but just the flexibility the of your 
the insights. Yeah, yeah, there's some, and it's very, I mean, just even with therapy, traditional talk therapy, I kind of relate it to the same thing. Like you come into this hour long session, we have insights, there's epiphanies, it feels good, it's landing for you, it makes sense. And then you go back to your ordinary life and take it with what you. happened to it? Where'd it go? We're, we're not, we're not integrating. So it's like, yeah. yes, integration is very important with psychedelics. It's important with anything that you do yeah. that you're wanting to uh, behavior change learn and make change around. You got to turn it yeah. into application. And so, yes, with psychedelics, there's other insights, maybe it's a vision maybe um something you you got the code for something or you got some download and it's great for that psychedelic medicine experience for during the ceremony but what does it matter if you're not turning it into application and integrating it into your everyday life how is it useful to you where do you get your money's worth so and i imagine that's where the abuse like line is is that like if you think that you can't integrate that experience beyond just the use of the substance right like then you're like well i have to use the substance because i have to have this experience yeah. and then you get addicted Journey hoppers to yeah yeah that's, that's yeah. That, i didn't know that was like, literal I term just made it up. Like somebody else has said that i don't think i made it up but yeah you get journey hoppers <laughs> coin it. just want to <laughs> just hop from journey to journey and there is a bit of it, you're high yeah. There is a bit of a high yeah. that happens, right? And so there's some, I, I think people are seeking that high also. Yep. And th- that experience that you described of trust, right? Being able to trust myself. I feel like that's the embodied piece of that, right? Mm-hmm. You're not doing this to avoid your life. You're not doing this to have such a unique and different experience that like you're doing it to distract yourself from your from life. You're, le- you're doing it to resource yourself, right? Yes. You're doing it to break that rigidity which when it comes to the science one thing that's really interesting about that because like i try to explain this too to clients and i was trying to explain to mike the other day that that wiring like part of part of what's so detrimental about um society and like western culture is is just the incessant repetition and almost hypnotic experience of like these social constructs right these we don't realize we're getting downloaded with these beliefs right but what what is paired together and repeats gets wired right Mm -hmm. what fires together wires together it's like every practitioner's textbook ever when you have that wiring just on repeat it creates stronger and stronger and stronger wiring Mm -hmm. so what's interesting about the research of psychedelics because i was trying to come up for the word i keep calling a cascade and essentially that's what it is Mm. but when you look at the the neurobiology it creates what's called a neuronal avalanche and I was like, that's cool. That's a, I didn't know there was even a technical term for that. And essentially what it is, is this cascade that happens of neuro excitation around your cortex that yeah. like creates all of this, you know, new wiring right. that is. Neuroplasticity. Are you speaking to that? Yeah. Is that yeah. same, same thing? Same idea. Yeah. Right. Because, well, I mean, and that's oh, in average. essence what the neuroplasticity is, is that you're changing the firing of, of the neurons and the synapses in your yeah, brain. Yeah, the capacity to rewire yeah. uh, the neural pathways, which, you know, the neural pathways are the the unhelpful or helpful thought patterns. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and what um, what really solidifies, concretizes uh, yeah. behavior change. Yeah, and it's so wild to, that I was like, oh, that's a cool term, like a neuronal avalanche. Neuronal an- avalanche, yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's I like a, that. I'm a big fan of that. I like that. And because it just gives you like, it almost gives you like a visual representation of like what could happen when you're, it's almost like a pouring out of that rigidity, yeah, right? Shaking like, up a snow globe. Shaking up the, the snow avalanche, globe. Avalanche, get that, that snow sh- shook around. Yeah, I love it. Because the well-walked um, trails are no longer in service. And so we need some new trails to walk. Yeah. And so yep. you got to shake it up a little bit and find those new paths to, to create and which is possible if you look at if if people look at depression and they think of like oh i want to take an antidepressant to fix my depression right and what they're saying is i don't have enough serotonin and i don't have enough dopamine and i want to boost that serotonin i want to boost that dopamine then why wouldn't you be able to have flexibility like Mm neuronal because that's what you're saying right when you're saying i'm going to take an antidepressant to feel better you're saying that you accept the fact and you acknowledge Mm -hmm. that you have plasticity right Right. Like that's essentially like at the core yeah. of what people are, are saying. And yeah, pills are, are so interesting because also, I mean, when we're taking prescription pills, we're just taking the prescription pill, <laughs> hoping yeah. that that solves all our problems. Right. Um, and, and yes, there is, you know, the, the neurochemistry around it and just naturally with the serotonin and the dopamine and all the receptors and the default mode network. Like there is a bit of a antidepressant effect mm-hmm. neurochemically, but uh, more so the neuroplasticity requires work. And so when we're just taking yeah. prescription pills, 
that's just like hell mary it'll make me feel better you know that's all that's all i need to do right to feel yeah. better is just take this pill <laughs> change but my mood right there's now. no work that i have to do <laughs> right because uh, you know i i society uh i think prefers it that way was that we don't really want to do the work yeah and so i think the psychedelics also just amplify where the work needs to be done and then it's up to you to go do the work not just take the pill if you really want yep. um which is the thing that change. creates the depression and anxiety in the first place is people right. avoidance of doing the work Lack right of willpower yeah, yeah no just like do it for me Right. But when you take action, you take agency and you have control or not even control, but just agency, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you, when you take those steps, then yes. you're like, oh, yeah, right? I'm capable. Yeah. I'm powerful. Yeah. I can think differently about myself. I can create change if I want. Yeah. Responsibility. You can take personal responsibility. Yeah. I also, I mean, it's very like scientific. Yes. I think we're in the scientific portion of the program right now yeah. called a- yeah. approach. Yeah. Approach. Yeah. Um, but there is a bit of like spirituality component mm-hmm. to it also that, you know, is, is not scientific that is responsible, I think for a lot of change too. And that's, that's been interesting uh, to navigate as a therapist, which relies on empirically validated treatments and, mm-hmm. and, you know, spirituality, can it, is it, is it measured? I mean, we've got mystical questionnaires to try and measure things, but um, it's non-measurable and a huge component to mm-hmm. wellness and improvement and change and, I really, really love weaving that into my work and is also why um, APB exists to help kind of normalize and make that more of a mainstay. Which is so important. Like, it's it's interesting. Like, you're like, is it the scientific part, right? Like, so I refer to this part of the this, this segment as an educational part, but mm-hmm. like, it doesn't have to be a scientific mm-hmm. period. Of, like, the, I want people to think about what research means. Right. Right. And that's exactly what you're saying, right? Like yeah. there are components to this. There's components to wellness and well being and health, like yeah. that you can't boil down into right. a scientific study. So if you're only looking at evidence based, empirically based things, right, then you're yeah. missing a large part of a broader scope, a broader picture that is probably taking up a larger portion of the human experience and human existence and what it means to heal. Yeah. Or be embodied or be alive or thrive in your life yeah yeah and can we go to our own research it's one of the things i love about my mic um you're also very nice mike one of the things i love about (laughs) thank you so much you're welcome i know you're waiting for that all your dreams come true yep means the feedback Um, it's a mic thing (laughs) mic thing um he researches for himself Mm mm-hmm Yep. he's the the test subject which sometimes i'm like I, maybe i don't want you to test that out and find out for yourself you know like i kind of like <laughs> I you how you are easy. let's not get the answer to that but he he's he's the test subject and and does the research and the, and the experimenter mm-hmm. and finds out for himself which i also really you know like there's something about not externalizing our power and our authority and our determinations and our judgments and bases and like figuring it out for yourself i mean within reason of course i don't you know there's there's other things here but in in general like just find out for yourself you and know? not you from this? the basis of like trying to fix yourself like he's not doing that because he thinks something's wrong with him that right. needs to change he's yeah. doing it because he's naturally curious right? That's right mike for the record mike bledsoe was on a prior um episode um you can go and check that out uh maybe i'll just link it in the mm-hmm. episode description and you can get to know ashley <sighs> and <Yeah>. mike <laughs> yes partner yeah but i it's not from a place of needing to fix no there's no deficit yep you know and that's it's optimizing it's potentiating yep and i found that to be true and i mean i'm sure you have too just in addictions work is that that self-sabotaging behavior Mm -hmm. right like you're not your behaviors but that Mm -hmm. self-sabotaging abusive behavior comes from the belief that you do have a deficit right it comes from the belief that you aren't enough and that there's a concept of even being enough that we should live up to right like there's there's this deep-rooted sense of like like missing something Mm -hmm. and you're trying to fill it or numb out the feeling of missing something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, if you, you can be curious, right. You can explore things in your own life. And I think that's a great uh, opportunity to switch over to the road back where we can talk about ways to engage with this work in your own life. All right. 
right. Welcome to the road back. Um, we're going to keep it short because we've been talking for a while. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been it's, it's, our, it's our adventure music. music. <laughs> we start with some curious music and then we like go into like, all right, take some agency. <laughs> I'm nervous. Go on your journey. Um, so I love what you've done with APP just because I, again, I'm super passionate about practitioners having a sense of community, resources to tap into, places to learn, places to turn to. Mm-hmm. Um, I was take, I'm was going to drop the website in the episode description. The website's beautiful. It's phenomenal. It's It, it encompasses everything you've talked about. It encompasses the, the code of ethics, mm-hmm. um, each different type of psychedelic, and then mm-hmm. mixed medicine models. Mm-hmm. And like, there's so many cool things on there. So I highly recommend that you go explore the APP website, um, alteredpractitioners.com, correct? Yes, alteredpractitioners.com. So what, in, in your opinion, you've built this beautiful thing. How do people start to engage on this journey if they're curious about psychedelics? Because I've tried to look up resources just as a general, like, you know, citizen looking up resources. And there's right. not that many who are like, it's hard to find yeah, places I mean, to start. It's really land dependent. It depends on where you're, what land you're standing on as you're seeking. You're talking from a client's perspective, right? Because the APP... Uh, is tailored to the psychedelic practitioners, the facilitators right. of the psychedelics. Um, but if you are a seeker, a journeyer, an explorer looking to um, get into 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 psychedelics, yes, it really does matter if it's a scheduled substance or not, where you're at, what your accessibility is. Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to is accessibility. Do you have accessibility? Yeah. To uh, to these medicines um, and safety, right? Yeah. It, yes, and safety. I mean, you want you want to have access to education also which i believe is the way is more than just having a ton of education so that we know about dosing and we know about uh who shouldn't be taking it we know about the contraindications with medications if we're on ssris or maois that stuff does matter yes um do i need a a sitter or a guide or a therapist i mean there's there's so many different things to educate around when it comes to psychedelics um you know, I guess legally, like the low hanging PC answer is find a clinical trial near you if right. you want to explore legally and, and you're seeking for mental health. You know, and if you if you feel pretty stable in your mental health and you have access, then, you know, find some education on on dosing and start small. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, if there's if if you're really seeking because there's some um, uh, mental health that you're wanting to work on, it probably you know could be smart having at least a sitter, maybe a guide or a therapist, just depending again on what you have access to, or an administrator even is what they're called in in Oregon. They're not therapists; they're administrators, and mm-hmm. the background all their backgrounds vary. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's, it's no, it hard to answer just I needing more context. Yeah, no, no. I think that's a great way to answer the question. I think it's a great way, great start for people because it's so funny because like when you're deeply involved in this work, it's like, mm-hmm. it's all right, where would I start? I don't remember where right, I would right. start. Right? Yeah. Like, I don't like, but I think that that sounds like perfect, uh, you know, advice or, or a direction for people because I know, I know there's a lot of places here in Austin that are popping up. Kuya is one of them, Aluma, mm-hmm. um, Roots Behavioral Health, they all do some sort of yes. like... Yes, well, there's ketamine, right? So ketamine, ketamine is le- legal yep. uh, for treatment, and the, it's a dissociative um, debate is out about it being a psychedelic. It alters your state, so it's, it's a psychedelic, and that's a good place to start. And I, I, you know, depends on the clinic that you go to technically. Again, medical necessity. There's some medical necessity in order to receive a treatment, but there's also clinics that will treat you if you're just wanting to explore, potentiate, optimize your experience. I feel like it's a little bit of like still going like like going to any doctor too, which I think people are not very well versed in in terms of like how do I talk to a medical professional? Like mm-hmm. I don't know what questions to ask. Mm-hmm. And I know that I've heard some horror stories about people that don't they say they do integrative work but they don't. They have people, you know, dosed with these medications and then they just leave them alone and it's like no, if you're going to that's that's not an ethical way to function. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to seek out like a, a a practitioner or administrator yeah. or anything, right? Like right. to know what kind of questions that, that you might ask them and, and what sort of, like yeah. what to look for yeah. in terms of getting started. Because there very much an underground. I mean, we're talking about like the above ground and practitioners are licensed or qualified or have done yeah. whatever to sit in front of you to call themselves, however they're framing or labeling themselves. Uh, but then there also is very much like an underground market where um, it is not governed and there aren't any qualifications, there aren't any requirements, certifications, or criteria that you need to meet in order to serve yep. um, and, and provide a, provide that service. And so that's when it becomes even more important to mm-hmm. 
ask the right questions and how long have you been uh, serving this for? What's your personal experience? Yeah. Well, what happens if things do go awry? What can I expect after? How, how do you work before and after, especially yeah. with psychedelics? What's your energetic hygiene? Do you have any traditions or rituals? Yeah. Is this a ceremony or is this like therapy? How, how would that practitioner, how yeah. are they going to work with you? Are they a coach? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> are they a therapist? Uh, what makes them a therapist? There's some people that call themselves therapists, psychedelic therapists now that aren't actually licensed therapists. Yeah. So it could get, it, you know, when we're in this unchartered, uh, Wild Wild West is so watered <laughs> down, but we're in this, yeah. Yeah, uncharted <laughs> territory. There, there's a lot of, um, I guess charlatan would be the right word to use there. I don't use that very often, but yeah, people that'll pop up and just you know want to take your money. And being very clear with people, like when after you found the right person to work with, being very clear with people about. Uh, what's going on for you biologically, right? Like taking inventory of like, yeah. how do I how do I treat my body? What do I eat? What do I ingest? Like things like that, because I imagine that all of those chemical compounds interact. Like you said, like the SSRIs. If I'm on an antidepressant, don't yeah. just go. Am I moving? Yeah. Am I going through divorce? What yeah. are my stress levels like? Yeah. I mean, what's the state of my mind? And like being better. honest with these people about where you're at, and that's again why you would want to right. know what kind of professional yes. you're and working hopefully with. Hopefully, they have a sound intake. Yeah, and they're also yes. running you through a process. Yes. Um, exploring these things, which again could be a bit cultural. Here we go, devil's advocate, because yes. you know in the Peru, in Peru or in these jungles, do they have like a full blown intake for you, and they want your family history and your social history and your medications and your supplements? And no, they're just you like, know, get in the tent. Not. They're like more medicine, <laughs> more medicine. Yeah. You know, is what you need. Which I'm not judging and saying is good or bad. So it, it really de- there's like a cultural perspective, but here we have the opportunity to you know we know these things mm-hmm. and um, and. Uh, yeah, I think it's better to be more prepared on the front end than than not. Yeah, I think that's very helpful for practitioners and clients alike. Mm-hmm. So um, do you have anything coming up going on with uh, altered practitioners? Do you have any workshops, any... We have some groups opening up. Um, Yeah, we really are geared towards the psychedelic practitioner. We just started having uh, medicine-specific groups. So when we first started about a year and a half ago, we had a – I just let the universe, like, support what the group should look like, the constellation of the group. And so we had a bunch of practitioners that are working with different medicines, mixed medicine groups. And we recently started medicine-specific groups. So we have a ketamine group coming up. And so – uh, ketamine is legal as we just discussed and um, there's a lot of therapists which are clinically trained and very well versed in the intellectual and the cognitive and I love that that's one of our groups that we're offering right now because it's such a great opportunity to blend them yeah. in this intersection with the more shamanic earth based ancestral practitioner yeah. which is completely different perspective and approach to the work and yeah. blending in that in that sort of a group so we, we have a ketamine specific group coming up next month we'll have a psilocybin specific group for psilocybin practitioners cool. uh, we just started a cannabis and salvia group which is wild there's really not a, a the practitioner that's running the group works with both cannabis and salvia but other than that you know there's really no like are they brother sister i'm not too uh i'm not an expert on these plans to say but um that is one group that we have right now is cannabis salvia so and i look forward to having more um medicine specific group groups more medicines come online um well and if you are a practitioner and you are you need that diagnostic lens as a pathway into this i do have some research that i'm dropping in the episode description that does talk about the impact um and collaboration combination of like a dbt cbt mm-hmm. um act things like that mm-hmm. so it does show in the research that these things are um if not an adjunct a, a remedy in in conjunction with those modalities that you might already be trained in so you IFS can is huge ifs yep yep there's a lot of research around the the evidence-based practices that already exist for mental health practitioners right. in collaboration with psychedelic use so. yes and it, the tricky part is just knowing what what program's the right program what's actually going to be recognized because it doesn't really exist right now right. the governing boards are still being figured out and so what does it actually always, mean what, always being figured what do i need yeah, yeah. to be licensed <laughs> so who we don't know yet um but there is a lot of good, nonetheless, a lot of good, regardless of what may or may not be recognized, a lot of good education that complements yep. the psychedelic space. So there's um, a place to start. Yeah. yeah. And not just these empirically validated therapies or orientations, but also other spiritual practices and traditional native indigenous practices too that support if you um, uh, have the wonderful, amazing opportunity to be able to study or apprentice 
under one of those. Yeah, that's a amazing i love the work that you do and i love that you have Thank created you. this space and i'm glad that i'm glad that you gave up your practice to do, right. to Here do I this am. we'll <laughs> see i'll keep you posted it's Working great out so far it's my we, it really is my heart's work yep and, and i love and you know it's funny because people always talk about like you know finding your purpose and finding your passion and mm-hmm. i think we think of it as being this like grand strike of lightning but it really isn't right it comes in this small curious yeah. way and you like if you notice like what you have the proclivity toward mm-hmm. right and you follow those lights that light up the path along the way you follow really the do curiosity yeah follow you the line curiosity. up right and there was i followed the momentum these groups started in my living room because <laughs> i needed community yeah and then yep. there was a demand for another group and then a demand for online groups and then a demand for a website and so i'm just really trying to listen yep. and not think and just feel I into the knowing and the intuition and, and trusting a lot of trust and surrender in this, um, in, in trusting you know, what I'm doing. And I really a hundred percent believe in it. So I trust that. Um, and I'm in service. I love I'm it. in service. I'm just doing what's being asked of me. That's such a badass work (laughs) thanks so much for coming on the show i really appreciate it um this is ashley carmen we'll be dropping all of her information in the episode description so you can go check her out on your own and uh we'll see you next time awesome thank you If you're having a mental health emergency, we urge you to dial the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or text the Crisis Text Line. Text HOME to 741-741.